Uh, and now let me introduce today's speaker, uh, Margaret DeFrancisco. She is uh, the president and CEO of the Georgia Lottery Corporation, a position she's held since 2003. And I think everyone in the state of Georgia knows that the Georgia Lottery is an extremely successful uh, program for us. It supports uh, uh, education and, and some things that are very near to everybody in this room. Certainly the Hope Scholarship is one of those things that is very dear to my heart. Uh, Margaret holds an undergraduate and graduate degree from State University of New York. And prior to coming to Georgia, she served uh, Governor Pataki in New York for seven years, uh, first in the Department of Motor Vehicles and then as head of the New York Lottery, which is the nation's largest. Under her leadership, uh, sales went from 3.6 to $5.4 billion. Uh, and uh, towards the end of that, the lottery achieved a, a record revenue for New York. Uh, as well as for North America. Now, the Georgia Lottery saw its sales and profit numbers under her tenure uh, increase as well. They reached 3.1, or about 3.5 billion, uh, with profit to education uh, reaching uh, over $850 million, so very important to our state. Uh, Margaret's overall business goal is to maximize revenue and to improve the public's understanding of why lotteries were created. She's launched several programs that focus on consumer education in that regard. Margaret's a firm believer in community service, uh, and as such, she is active in several boards, including the Georgia Chamber of Commerce, the Board of Visitors for University of Georgia's uh, School of Public and International Affairs, and she also serves as a trustee for St. John Fisher College in Rochester. Uh, Margaret was recently named one of the top 100 notable Georgians by Georgia Trend Magazine. And in 2007, uh, the Atlanta Woman Magazine named her Woman of the Year. Uh, Margaret's topic this morning is the lottery, big business, and big fun. So please uh, help me in joining, uh, in welcoming Margaret to our Terry Third Thursday Speaker Series. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's, it's about the children. It's all about the children. I'd like to start with this slide. I don't have very many slides this morning, but this is Tessa Antoinette DeFrancisco. Um, and she is our one and only grandchild. And she's just, she just turned 15 months last week. Um, and the fellows at work, my, part of my executive team, um, because I drive my personal car as a uh, a six-speed Mini Cooper convertible, the boys decided that it would be fun to buy me a little plastic Mini Cooper for Tessa. So for her birthday, um, that was Christmas time, for her birthday, I dragged it up to Boston um, so that Tessa could sit on it and honk its horn. So, <laughs> so that is Tessa. And everything that we do truly is all about the children in Georgia. I'm really delighted to be here, was um, very pleased at the turnout, because this means that you all got up as early as I did this morning to be here. And fortunately, it's so early, there wasn't gridlock, and it's not raining out, so everyone is here, and it's just a wonderful thing. So <laughs> we're very glad. Um, so thank you for this invitation. And I'm here to talk about your lottery, your lottery, um, and how the dollars are generated for Hope and Pre-Kindergarten. And in these brief remarks, which I won't talk for a very long time, because what I have found is that folks learn a whole lot more um, by asking questions. You learn more from each other in the questions that you ask than if I were to drone on forever, which is another reason why I don't have very many slides. So I'm going to tell you about lottery games. I'm going to talk a bit about the history of lotteries. Um, your lottery's ranking in the world, which I think is really important for you to know and to carry out from, from um, this talk this morning and also the incredible results that have happened over the last 19, um, 19 years on the 29th of June. So next year will be an entire generation, 20 years old, the Georgia Lottery Corporation. So um, Adam, I hope you're close by. Ah, yay. <clears throat> we have raised to date $13.5 billion for hope in pre-kindergarten. 
That's more than 1.4 million HOPE recipients, and I won't embarrass the students in the room by asking them if they are on HOPE or not, because often um, I have young people, particularly young males, and I'm the mother of two sons, so it's okay for me to say this. They'll say, I had HOPE, but I lost it. Young women will say to me, well, I had hope, and I had it all four years. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so in more than 1.1 million pre-kindergarteners, and the interesting thing is that first group of four-year-olds years and years ago are now juniors and or seniors in college. So we really have done an entire generation, um, and it has been just truly, truly amazing. And I should note, um, I'm joined here this morning by great coincidence by Jane Gregory, who's a senior vice president at BBDO Atlanta, and they are our advertising um, agency and have been for nearly six years. I'm often asked, you know, who, who does that work? Um, and sometimes it's done, I hate to say this, Jane, sometimes it's done because somebody doesn't like a commercial we've done. Um, but the, uh, the current um, Hunter commercial is a product of BBDO. I love when the deer says, bang. So let's, let's begin and talk about, uh, about our games. Um, we're really in the entertainment business. Our games are meant to entertain and to be fun for folks. Um, and I like to say that the lottery is about human behavior and random occurrences. And the challenge for us is to figure out that intersection of the random occurrences and the human behavior. How are those humans going to respond and react about the, the random occurrences that are the results of our various drawings or our scratch cards? We actually have um, two different types of games, which I'll talk about in a minute. We have about 280 employees. And um, th we are a sales and marketing organization. So about 156 of those 280 employees are engaged very much in the sales and marketing effort. The rest are all there in support. Some of them don't like to acknowledge that, but that's okay. So we have people in accounting, we have people in the legal department, we have lots of IT people who think they run the world, no offense to anyone in IT. <clears throat> We have licensing and communications, and we have a whole group who does prize payments, and we have call centers who help both our retailers and our consumers. Um, we have a seven-member board of directors. Your next month's speaker, Joe Rogers, his wife, Fran, actually sits on our board. They are appointed by the governor. Currently, we have a combination of Purdue and Deal appointees. Their, um, their job is to have oversight on the operations of the organization. We're all about fun for our consumers, but for a very serious cause, and that's for the education of the children of Georgia. So we're meant to um, offer you a few moments of fun if you like to scratch, a few hours of fun if you like to play Kino with your friends in a local social establishment, or a few days of fun if you are holding either a Mega Millions or a Powerball ticket and you think, Holy Moses, what, what, what could I do? What would I do if I won? Which, by the way, Powerball rolled last night. That's a part of our jargon. The jackpot was not hit. So for Saturday night, it is $100 million, which you will note on the BBDO produced billboards that are um, all over the state of Georgia. And hopefully you passed one on your way here, and you'll pass one on your way home, and that will key you in to say, hmm, perhaps I ought to spend $2 on a Powerball ticket or $1 on a Mega Millions ticket. Someone in California won the other night. And we did have a world-breaking record jackpot, which I would guess if I asked people to raise their hands, how many of you participated in the $656 million Mega Millions jackpot? I'm sure there were lots of you who were either in office pools or family pools or neighbor pools. That was world record breaking there has never been anything like it and we may not see it again I mean because again it's about random occurrences so um, but that was very exciting very very exciting and that run raised 25.2 million dollars all by itself just for Georgia just that game just that run and we sold about a billion and a half dollars worth of tickets during that run around the country so um, and that's you know, we're, we're described as a traditional lottery. That means we have two different types of games. The, the scratch-offs that I mentioned, 
Um, they come in various themes, various colors, various varieties, various prize payout percentages, and price points, so that there is a huge menu. Um, so you can buy a scratch off for one, two, three, five, ten, and twenty dollars. So if you're nervous about spending five dollars or ten dollars, you can buy one of our one dollar tickets. Um, the Lucky Sevens, which I find the artwork to be terribly outmoded and outdated, we don't dare change it because it is one of the most popular tickets. The two dollar Jumbo Bucks is the most successful instant ticket, instant game in the entire world. It has sold more than anything else, although I think the Chinese and the Italians may beat us in the next couple of years because they have expanded greatly in the scratch category. The other type of games in the traditional form of lottery are the drawing games, like Mega Millions and Powerball. Um, we're very fortunate that WSB TV here in Atlanta has um, taken our drawings and broadcast our drawings, produced and, and broadcast them for the entire um, length of time that the Georgia Lottery has been around. And we're the ones who broadcast the Mega Millions drawings. So the Mega Millions drawing comes from here. We did try to get the Powerball drawing, but um, the Florida Lottery, because they had it in Orlando, now have it in Tallahassee, and that's okay. We don't mind. But we do like the fact that Mega Millions comes from, from here, and they do, a, and by the way, do a wonderful job. Um, so that, that's, you've, if you have watched, it takes probably two plus hours and a dozen people um, to produce a one minute drawing. Lots of security, um, lots of procedures, lots of, of very tight security, and because those drawings are truly the base of our, the integrity of our of our games, and so it's really important that they be done and done correctly. Um, so we also have the daily games: Cash Three and Cash Four, Fantasy Five, Georgia Five. Um, we have Win for Life and Decades of Dollars. Decades of Dollars is one of our newer games. It has the Gary and Marty the Geese who are living large because one of them has won Decades of Dollars. It took over a year to get winners and now we're having winners like all the time. We've had three Georgia winners. It's a great proposition, $250,000 a year for 30 years is the top prize. So we've now had three Georgia top prize winners, a couple in Virginia, one in Kentucky. So um, we're excited about that. The other state in it is Arkansas. So we do lots of cross things. Um, both Mega Millions and Powerball are now national games. They were confined. Uh, Mega Millions was the 12 larger states. Powerball was kind of the rest of the lotteries, and now only um, California does not sell Powerball and, and Florida does not sell Mega Millions. Otherwise, every other state. And the reason they don't, by the way, is that they have very strong in-state lotto games and didn't feel that they wanted to introduce another mega jackpot game. So it's probably more information that you need. But um, I always find that it's, it's better to kind of just give it all out. So <clears throat> a little bit about the history of, of lotteries. Um, the first state-run lottery was in Italy, actually in Genoa, in 1530. So they've been around for a very long time. The Kino game I mentioned a moment or two ago was actually introduced in China a couple thousand years ago. Um, in the early history of our country, George Washington used lotteries for the Revolutionary Army. Um, the very early colleges that were established were established with lotteries. So um, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Dartmouth, all lotteries, and this lottery is not the first lottery in Georgia. From the 1700s up until about the Civil War, there were um, lotteries used in Georgia for public works, for roads and bridges and hospitals. And if any of you went to the Atlanta History Center for the Benjamin Franklin exhibit a few years ago, there was a room probably about this size um, devoted to old lottery tickets some of the old um, books, dream books, and one of the tickets that was in there, um, supplied by Scientific Games, by the way, was from Savannah, and it actually had uh, security features on it, which I thought was amazing. It was from 1791. It was a lottery that was going to go to help um, build a hospital for injured merchant sailors that could then come, come to shore and, and be taken care of in Savannah. They were outlawed um, in, by Congress in 1895 because of some corruption in Louisiana. <clears throat> and in 
And they didn't actually come back into being again until the 1960s. Does anyone know the first modern lottery in the United States? It was because they needed revenue in this state. It is in New England. It was New Hampshire in 1964. The second lottery in the United States was New York. And if you looked at a map of the United States, it, it all started in the Northeast, moved to the Midwest, went all the way out west, and then um, started coming south, Florida being ahead of Georgia. But Georgia is actually one of the newer lotteries. And um, the newest is Arkansas, established a couple of years ago. So we've been around for a bit, but we're not among the older lotteries. As far as proceeds, proceeds around the world um, go to, to different good causes. It can be for sports facilities, uh, some of the European countries, for shoring up antiquities, old buildings, or artwork. Um, it, in Pennsylvania, the good cause is senior citizens. A lot of times it's education. In Colorado, it's environment, parks and recreation. Um, and as you all know, the beneficiary here are the students of Georgia through Hope and Pre-Kindergarten. There are now 43 lotteries in states in the United States, plus the District of Columbia. So there are 44 lotteries. The only places that don't have lotteries are Alaska and Hawaii, Wyoming, more cattle and elk than people, Nevada and Utah for totally different reasons, and then Mississippi and Alabama. But the rest of the country all have lotteries and all raising money for good causes every day. So around the world, there are about 200. And some are operated by government, some by private companies. Um, and we are a public benefit corporation. We're not a state agency. We do not get one thin dime of appropriation from the General Assembly. We are completely self-sustained and self-contained and self-supporting. Um, and that's fairly different. The, most of the models around the country um, are actually attached, in fact, to the New York lottery. Um, I was a direct report to Governor Pataki and had to go hat in hand to the Division of the Budget and the Department of Civil Service and the State Comptroller every time I wanted to do something. Um, so we have, in the enabling legislation that we have, great flexibility to do what we've been able to do. And I think that's one of the reasons why we have been so successful. And that success is due to Governor Zell Miller, which is a story about education. Um, for those of you who don't know, he was born and raised up in Young Harris, is um, there today, actually living there today with Mrs. Miller. And his mother was widowed when he was quite young. But education was really important to the, to the Miller family. And so he had started college, left college, joined the United States Marine Corps. And when he got out of the Marines, he was able to use what some would consider the supreme merit scholarship, the GI Bill, to finish college. And you know, he was very active in local politics and then obviously state politics and ended up his last position was um, as a US Senator. But when he was getting ready to run for governor, it was um, Paul Begala and James Carville from Louisiana, um, who urged him to run on the lottery and, and said, you can do this. You will have 60 plus percent of the people in favor. There will be 30 plus percent who will be against you. And those people are going to hand you your head on a silver platter. And they will be very vocal, which they were. And maybe even some of you were around or active either for or against the lottery coming to Georgia. And he described to me, I asked when I first came, could I meet him? I really want to understand how he was able to think through making this a different lottery from the other lotteries that existed before. And he really wanted the money to be supplemental rather than supplanted. I mean, one of the questions that I had to answer in New York all the time was where's the money really going because it was an offset to the general fund it was not it was not money that was dedicated and devoted to specific very specific things so he said you know margaret we're in the buckle of the bible belt here and and georgia is a very conservative state and to bring the lottery to georgia was a major undertaking but he said i looked at the state and thought how will we keep the best and brightest young people 
in the state of Georgia to become the leaders in communities all over. And truly, it was because of that and worried about the brain drain because if you go to college in another state, chances are you're not going to come back because you're going to meet somebody, you're going to get drawn away to a job in another city or another state, or you're going to stay in that, in that college town and never leave. And of course, in spades, it has worked. 1.4 million HOPE recipients are now working and living and leading communities all over the state of Georgia. So he did choose to organize it as an entrepreneurial enterprise and also to keep it separate and apart from. In fact, our legislation even says free from political influence. Hmm. But the key factors about the organization and where the money goes are truly why, this, why the lottery has succeeded. And I also think it's um, our sales and marketing effort, Jane. <laughs> so at nearly $3.6 billion in revenue this last fiscal year, and we're now tracking for probably about 3.8, thanks to Mega Millions and Powerball, truly, um, because all boats rise when, when those are big, people will say, well, you know what, I'm going to get a Mega Millions ticket, but give me one of those jumbo bucks. So it really helps all, all of our games. Um, the, so in the world for, if we did 3.6, the, the world did about $262 billion. Because there are lotteries now and about, uh, there are about 200 lotteries around the world. And in North America last year, it was $67 billion. So our worldwide rankings for calendar year 2011, we're number 17 out of those nearly 200 lotteries um, in worldwide, our total worldwide sales. We're beat by China, Italy, Japan, the UK, Spain. Note that those are countries. And also a few states in the United States who have um, much greater populations than we. Um, our total per capita sales were number 10 out of nearly 200. We're number nine in worldwide instant sales, that's the scratch product. And we're number two in worldwide instant per capita sales. We are a distant second to the state of Massachusetts who's been scratching since 1974. In the US, just the United States, we're number five and you can see who beats us. Massachusetts is sort of an, an, an anomaly, but they've done a phenomenal job over the years. And they don't have the, the geography to deal with it, we do. They're not nearly as spread out. And there we are in per capita sales. Um, if you knock out DC, that makes us number two. Because uh, the District of Columbia is sort of an aberration because the population kind of doubles in size every day because of people coming in from Maryland and Virginia. So, but we love our colleagues in DC. They do a great job. Here's where, where we are. Um, this is the, the growth since the very beginning. And the, that red line, back in 2003, the summer before I came, there was a study commission um, by the General Assembly because they wanted to know what's going to happen with hope and you know how do they do they need to make adjustments and at that time the lottery had turned over that year 751 million dollars and I mean that was that was incredible and just incredible results and the the study committee was told at that time you can probably take to the bank 750 million dollars but you probably shouldn't really plan on much more well needless to say we've produced a whole lot more and of course, a whole lot more has been spent as a result of our producing a whole lot more. But the demand has really, um, really outstripped the supply of what we can give. And I think it's really important for those stats that I gave you a few minutes ago about where we rank. Those are important stats for you to remember when you hear other things about the lottery's not doing its job, they're not producing enough, they're spending too much here or there or wherever. We're a top performing lottery, not just in the United States, not just in North America, but in the world. Um, and what has happened is we've all become, as a state, the victim of our own success 
in the fact that we have been able to produce so many HOPE recipients and so many pre-kindergarteners. We've paid out over $21 billion in prizes since inception. Um, last year, $2.1 billion. That's why people play, everyone. I mean, they play because they want to win, and so we have to give them prizes or they won't play again, and that's really important. And, and you should know that 80% of Georgians play the lottery from once in a while to several times a week, which is a higher statistic than the United States, which is about three quarters, 75% of citizens in the United States play the lottery. Um, our, our big winners, we've had a bunch of big winners. Um, a few years ago, we had the folks who won Mega Millions to the tune of like $275 million. They bought two tickets. And they pay taxes, federal taxes and state taxes. And the CFO of the state at the time called me up a after that win and said, so Margaret, how much is their initial state tax and when are we going to get it? <laughs> and it was a windfall to the state of Georgia, unexpected of $18 million just on that initial win. The feds love us, too, um, because we, we are required to withhold 25%, and then, of course, um, those folks end up paying federal and state taxes in perpetuity, and hopefully they do a great job of it and get good advice. So, um, Which, by the way, meeting the winners is one of the best parts of this job because they come from all walks of life, and they have dreams and aspirations like all of us, only they're able to fulfill them because they've had a big win. And many of them now, because they have had, we've heard such horrid stories about people who have like really blown it and been disastrous, many of them now come to us having spoken with accountants, financial advisors, lawyers, to really get themselves in order. Because big money can last for generations. Um, and I'm not sure that any one of us would know what to do with a major windfall immediately. So um, they, they do, uh, it's, it's much, much better. And I will also tell you that during the last recession, we've had lots of people not want to come forward out of fear more than anything else. They don't want other people to know that they have money. And it's usually not necessarily the public, it's people closer to them. They're, and that's actually my biggest worry about our winners, is not them or what they may do. In fact, I had um, a gal in our Long Island office tell me one time, um, you know, Margaret, she said, if you're a jerk walking in here before we give you a big check, you're just a jerk walking out with a big check. And her point was, if you're not a good decision maker beforehand, you're not going to be a good decision maker afterwards. So um, that, that's why I'm very encouraged by the fact that we, uh, we have people getting a lot of advice. And I would encourage any of you to do that and also to make a great donation to the Terry School of Business once you have won. <laughs> um, we do, um, we have... I mentioned our games, and I mentioned we have a massive distribution network. Uh, we have about 8,500 retailers in the state of Georgia, um, including Publix and Kroger and Quick Trip and a lot of, of corporates, a lot of independents. Um, they employ, we figure, about 50,000 clerks every day to sell our tickets, so there's an employment thing going on here. Um, and our 8,500 retailers earned about... $230 million in commissions last year, <clears throat> excuse me, and over 82% of them are actually small businesses. So um, we're very, we think we're very good for business, not just because um, we have 8,500 retailers, but because of their employees, because of our winners who pay taxes and then spend money within the communities, reinvest. They give to, and they certainly do, I love the philanthropy part. Um, and maybe WABE will get some money from big winners, too. You just, you never know, Karen. So our largest retailer in the state is the airport, our airport kiosks. Hopefully you have seen them. They are in both in North and South Baggage Claim. We also have a couple of retail locations in D and E, Concourses D and E. Um, not, it's not us. These are our employees um, who sell. They do a marvelous job. And they've had lots of celebrities who've come through. Um, Jerome Bennis is one who is, has been a, a, a regular when he comes through town. Um, they do a fabulous job. And this has been sort of the model now for other states who are looking to, um, to have kiosks in the airport. With 55,000 employees and 90 million passengers, we are capturing a few of them. So that's a great thing. 
besides our three main vendors, I hinted at Scientific Games. Scientific Games International, which is up 400, um, exit 12B on Bluegrass Lakes Parkway, they are one of the scratch printers. There are only three in the world. And they have a plant here. They have plants in other parts of the world, but a major plant. They print for the world. And so things are printed here. I'm sure they're taken down to the port and transported all over the country or put on airplanes. Um, they employ about 1,000 people. And um, they do a great job for us. They're the, one of the th only three, but so a leader in the industry and have been around for a very long time. We actually write checks to vendors, 300 vendors with a Georgia address. We buy media, lots of media, with um, 104 radio stations, 34 broadcast and cable TV stations, 22 out of homes. Um, those are our billboards, the billboard companies, and uh, 10 sports properties. And um, here's one that you might recognize. Mentioned Joe Rogers. This was our um, Waffle House Falcons ticket. And we did a um, halftime show, which, by the way, the Falcons, Rich McKay's a great guy, too. The Falcons have been fabulous to deal with. Waffle House was fabulous to deal with. What we came up with was a scratch-off that every ticket was a winner, because if you didn't win, you could take it into Waffle House and redeem it for a free waffle. So the halftime show was to show that we had a promotion to win $200,000 home makeover. That's that part. And those were triangles where you see the house. And if they could turn the triangle, and it would show the ticket. And then they could turn the triangle again um, to show Waffle House. And we had dancers who, it was, just, it was fabulous. I probably should have brought a little bit of the, the recording so you could see it. But um, they're great. They're great to work with. We also work with the Braves and the Hawks um, because they're our audience. The people who sit in those stands for those sporting events are our audience. We also work with the University of Georgia um, football team through the radio stations and Georgia Tech and uh, some, many of the other colleges in the state. We participate in over 200 community events, fairs, festivals around the state every year. Um, we feel that it's really important to be out in communities to engage with people, to maybe even teach them how to play if they're part of the 20% that don't play the lottery ever. Um, and uh, again, scientific games, if anyone is ever really interested in like looking behind the curtain to see how things are done, um, we can, you can't go up and knock on the door of scientific games and say, hi, I heard that you do printing, could we? But we could arrange if you were ever truly interested. Uh, it's highly technical. It's highly secure. Um, and it has evolved over time since the first scratch off was sold in Massachusetts in 1974. Uh, it is really an amazing, amazing process. When we um, introduced Powerball to Georgia a couple of years ago, we did a flash mob at the airport totally on a flash mob dance, totally unexpected. Um, the Mega Millions ball was at the top of the escalator and met the power ball and all of a sudden the music started and they danced their way down to baggage claim and by the time we finished, it was about five minutes, by the time we finished we had over a hundred local dancers dancing to various genres of music um, and we attracted quite a, quite a crowd, quite a crowd. So this became the standard in the industry. People were amazed by this. And um, it was on YouTube. You can still find it, someone who actually recorded it with their cell phone. We had to take it down because we had to pay for the music. So um, we only had it up for a short period of time. But it was great fun, great fun. We also, um, oh, and we've been copied by the Delta employees. The Delta employees recently had flash mobs up. So. We felt very good about that. We also had um, a statewide music search. And this was in, in four genres of music, where we held auditions all over to see up and coming talent. You know, could they, and we used local judges from, from the radio stations to see if we could come up with up and coming talent that could then win and go to Capitol Records Tower in Los Angeles and record their music. So the, um, we had four Georgia judges for the finalists. 
uh, Dallas, Austin, Monica, um, Clay Cook, and Sean Mullins were all our judges. And we did a live television program with the 12 finalists to pick the top four. And it was during Snow Week here last year. When it was nearly shut down, we were talking about it earlier. It was a Friday night. It was a live TV show. And Tuesday night around 6 o'clock when it was still snowing, um, we said, should we bag this whole thing? And, and when you think about producing, I know what it takes to produce a television commercial. When you talk about a television show, it's just that much larger. But I will tell you, we have been nominated for an Emmy for that show. So we are so excited. We will know next month whether we've actually won. Um, this is the Southeast Emmys, and we're just we're ecstatic about it. And we're so glad that we didn't let the snow and the ice <laughs> deter us from getting it done. We also um, have to be active in the social media. So we've done some Facebook and Twitter promotions, um, and that is great fun. We know that. Um, trying to appeal to young people um, in, in, in this day and age and, and to replace our aging players with young people, you need to be where they are. Um, that was one of the reasons that we did the all access music search was to appeal to young folks. Not that we didn't want to appeal to our whole crowd of players because everyone loves music, regardless of the genre that they enjoy. Everyone has a love of music. So to bring it all together, and then to take some questions, I'll show you our, our peach. At the center of it all are our games. And in this very unique organization with a very unique mission. So we've got the games. And out from that are our retailers and their employees, our customers and their winners, the local communities, um, certainly our hope and, um, and pre-K recipients and all of the bankers and lawyers and federal and tax, federal tax and state tax people um, and where money is spent. So, so we know that the university system and the, for the pre-kindergarten program have really benefited. So I hope as employers that you sell and continue to sell the idea of hope um, and that you periodically play the lottery because um, today could be the day. <laughs> We've been very, very fortunate and very, we're very grateful for the response to the lottery over the last almost 19 years. So um, we think we've been good for business. We've certainly been good for education. And I'd be happy to take any burning questions you might have. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, excuse me a minute. Um, when you ask your questions, can we get a microphone to you? We're recording or I this. Can, and, and, or I can repeat or it. She can repeat it, but uh, we would like to, everyone to be able to hear it. Yeah, I was wondering what uh, games do you personally like to play and why? We can't. Can't? Why, we can't, why is that? We cannot play the lottery. We cannot purchase tickets. Um, not anyone who works for the lottery or lives in our households. However, when I go home to New York and visit my folks, I will buy their newest scratch. If I could play here, um, besides throwing a buck every once in a while for Mega Millions or $2 for Powerball, Fantasy Five is a great game. It's every day. Um, there's, it starts at fifty thousand dollars. If it isn't won, it rolls over. You have a one in nine chance of winning a prize, and it could be a free ticket, which gets you back in the game. Um, it, it's really super. And we have had, we have had a couple of million dollar prizes. So it's not totally life changing, but you could have some fun. You could, you could have some fun. So that's. Um, and I think that somebody asked, why aren't we allowed? I think it's more perception than anything else. As I mentioned about the drawings, it's a couple of hours, 12 people. Um, it, it, everything is random, random selection of ball machines, random selection of the ball sets. Um, all of it is recorded, the pretest, the post-test, the actual drawing. Um, but there is the perception. And so as long as that perception would exist, um, we are not allowed to play. Yes, ma'am. I know a number of states have made announced plans to sell tickets online. Mm -hmm. Does Georgia have plans? We're actually looking at it all. Um, and the reason that we're looking at it 
is that the Department of Justice reversed itself just before Christmas. Um, for years and years, the Department of Justice has leaned heavily on the 1961 Wire Wager Act. There weren't any lotteries back then. There was no internet back then. But it was about um, bookies making bets using telephones. So that's what they've said has made the internet illegal. But the Department of Justice said no, as long as lotteries either have a compact with other lotteries, like Mega Millions or Powerball, there could be internet wagering. What will happen um, is that a lot of states will need uh, either regulatory or legislative um, change to be able to do it. But a lot of us are already looking at um, that next step. Because if you're driving home and you see our billboard, um, but you're not near a store, and you could actually go online and buy a Mega Millions ticket for tomorrow night's drawing, we want to be able to give people that convenience. So it will come. It will come. But I think it will probably come slowly. We tend to be, um, as an industry, very, very conservative and very slow. Getting Powerball here took almost two years and a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, and I'm still bearing the bruises of trying to convince my colleagues that it was a good idea to have two national games, but be that as it may. How do we decide the price of these tickets? As you mentioned, Mega Ball is $1, and right. the Power Ball is $2 now. It used right. to be $1. How that, does this whole, whole thing work? It, it, actually, that was part of uh, the strategy, which I will tell you, um, it was a cross-section of colleagues and our, our main vendors who sat here in Atlanta in our offices in February of 2009 trying to figure out what to do about those two mega jackpot games because they suffered from jackpot fatigue. You know, it takes now $100 million before anybody says, oh, well, it's $100 million, maybe I'll go buy a ticket. You used to get lines at $10 million. So the strategy was, let us sell both games because then we'll have mega jackpot games with drawings four nights a week. Then let's change one or both games to $2 after we kind of monitor the sales, monitor the jackpots, because these really are, people buy them because they're, they hope to win the jackpot. Then the third would be to then also develop concurrently the next national product that would not be an echo of either of those, nor of any of the things that we already have, and will probably have an interactive component, if not immediately, as it evolves. So we looked at it. Powerball has a great, is a great brand. I mean, it's a just plain great brand. It's been around a lot longer than Mega Millions. And so that was, again, I bear the bruises in from that conversation. Um, we decided that of the two games, we needed differentiation. And of the two games, that changing Powerball to $2 was a better idea than changing Mega Millions or changing both to $2. But where on earth can you lay down a buck or lay down $2 and win hundreds of millions? I mean, it's crazy. It's just crazy. And it was also sort of a reflection of our instant product, which is at 1, 2, 3, 5, 10, 20. So that has evolved, but the drawing games have not even though their prizes are massive. I was curious uh, what your thoughts were on the class two type slots and if you think that will ever be in the state of Georgia. This is a very conservative state. Um, this is a public policy decision and it really is up to the public policy makers and the business community to decide that this is a good idea for the state of Georgia. It's been done elsewhere and very successfully. Could it be executed? Absolutely. But until those decisions and discussions and deliberations and debates and all of that are all settled, we're the executors of public policy. So we just kind of sit by and watch and listen. Uh, since your tenure, what, which games didn't perform well? And, um, and why do you think they didn't perform well? Maybe they're no longer around. Um, well, one was a Lotto South, um, which we did with Virginia and Kentucky. Win for Life became the sort of replacement for that. And Decades of Dollars is um, another game that we've introduced. 
we try to think of different propositions. And it's been really hard with the drawing games because um, we're very much a scratch state. I mean, very much. About between 65 and 70 percent of our sales come from the scratch product. So it's hard to kind of jazz up the, the drawing games. And of course, wouldn't you know, as soon as we decided to stop Lotto South, we had a $27 million winner here in Georgia. I mean, it figures. It figures. And we have had a couple of, um, a few dogs in the scratch product, but you know, those come in and out of the market at a fairly good clip, so. Um, it... And we still have people playing win for life. It's a great proposition. It's $1,000 a week for the rest of your life. Hi, the, uh, the 13.5 billion raised for uh, hope, so certainly a huge, uh, huge amount. Uh, do you feel like, uh, or is there a shifting of uh, that 13.5 billion from one demographic to another? You know, somebody wins, but do you think that somebody loses or a group loses too? I'm not sure I understand because the 13.5 billion is truly just the profit, the net proceeds that have gone to support Hope and Pre-Kindergarten, um, and we don't make the decisions. We turn, we raise the money, and we turn it over. And how it's appropriated and given out is actually run by. Georgia Student Finance Commission administers HOPE, and the Department of Early Care and Learning, um, also called Bright from the Start, administers pre-kindergarten. Okay, so the, do you think the, the people, your target uh, group uh, audience that's playing or receiving the, the benefits of the lottery, is it going to a different, uh, different group? Um, the, the demographic is reflected in the population of Georgia. Um, the average player is a, <clears throat> see if I can remember this, Jane, you might be, have to help me, it is a mid-40s male with um, some college and uh, income of $50,000. That's average, so it's on all sides. And women tend to play the scratch product more than men, but they play the lower priced scratch product more often. Yes, sir. Hey, um, looking at the peach is pretty eye-opening, and it actually, I've always been a big proponent of the lottery. I think <laughs> you all give a tremendous amount of money back to the, the state and the community. When you look at that, it appears that virtually all of it gets recycled to some degree, but yet there's still a ton of uh, criticism that goes on that you're not giving enough back. Um, I, never do you ever hear in publications the $2.1 million that's given back in prizes is the incentive to play. Why do you think there is still such the public perception that you don't do enough? Um, and I'll, I'd, I'd be curious, the $142 million that is basically the only operating expense, to, you know, which is a very small percentage, how does that rank um, around the country or the, or the world? Um, we're, we're, we're a pretty lean, mean machine. And of that, um, we're less than we, being the Georgia Lottery Corporation, we're less, we're running at about 0.9 zero percent of the total to operate the entire thing. That's all of our employees, that's all of our offices. We have offices around the state for the convenience of our consumers. Um, that's everything. So it's, um, I think part of it, quite honestly, is that we're very high profile. We are a sales and marketing organization. So sometimes um, it's really easy, and it's really easy to pick on success. Um, so I think that may be a bit of it. And you know, I really hope that's one of the things, reasons I love to come out to groups I do, I try to talk to rotaries around the state too, is to try and get out that message. You know, this is where we rank, this is what we do, this is how we run, and this is what we produce. Um, to sort of maybe counter a little bit of some of that other perception. Okay, we've got time for one more question if um, someone's got that uh, last question. In fact, I mentioned to President Adams that perhaps he wanted to talk to the kids over at Red and Black who are writing editorials about the lottery. <laughs> because they seem to have it a little convoluted. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about how the $230 million in commissions goes? Is, that, you know, is it a commission on each winning ticket sold, or what's the incentive for the retailer to um, carry the lottery? It is actually 6% of their sales. So it, it, it's six percent. It's six cents on every dollar that they sell. Okay. 
Right. They used to have a blended rate. They do no longer have a blended rate. Okay. Uh, Margaret, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. On behalf of our alumni board, I'd like to present you with this uh, glass sculpture by a local artist, Loretta Eby. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Uh, Lovely. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much.